we were handed a bayonet welded to the top of a piece of one-inch gas piping. And that was supposed to be a weapon against invading forces. Welcome to the podcast where we track down Australian war veterans, have a chat with them and hear their stories. I'm Alex Lloyd and this is Life on the Line. They were building positions in there if for a fight. If anyone to us, by the time anyone got to us... I think it was chaos. ...the weather was so bad, there would be no to run boots full of blood. And the next thing I hear was alarms screaming. Chances were very, very slick. The soldiers didn't want to go into the ambushes, so they'd send the kids in first. So he was sent in first into an ambush and he got shot in the stomach. It was very hard for me, very hard for my family. And the pain burst. Proud of the crew, proud like of what kid. I've achieved and what I'm doing. The volunteer for service was in effect to put your life on the line. Today's conversation is between Angus Horden and World War II veteran Doug Gilling. I'm Angus Horden and I'm speaking today with Doug Gilling. Doug, thanks very much for joining us on the show. Well, it's a pleasure. Doug, let's start at the beginning. Where were you born? I was born in Sydney in Mosman in 1921. I think the street still exists, but unfortunately I've been back there and I noticed there's no plaque on the door where I was born. So they obviously obviously missed the occasion. Okay, good on you. Do you have any military history in your family? Yes, my father was English and he came out to Australia in 1919 after the he was invalided out of his own regiment, which was the King's own regiment from Liverpool. And uh, he suffered in France, I don't know what injuries, but he finished up in a hospital in Edinburgh, uh, which was for officers who had been shell-shocked. If you know a little bit about the First World War, uh, an officer was treated for shell shock and the uh, private and below were uh, treated pretty abominably. They didn't get much treatment. But father got splendid treatment there and uh, he'd practised architecture in England before the war and uh, that's before the Great War. And uh, then when he was invalided out of the army at the end of 1916, he made moves to come to, first of all, to New Zealand and where he, where he met up with my mother, who'd come over before that with my brother. Tell us about your childhood, please. Well, it was interesting in that, being the son of a, an architect, in the 19... He, when my father came to Australia, he joined a much older English architect called Joseland, and they formed the, pet, the firm Joseland and Gilling, and they had a remarkable, successful practice through the 20s. My childhood was virtually that of a a rich child and a a spoiled rich child. We lived in Vaucluse. We had a house in the mountains and uh, had all the trappings of wealth. And Doug, could you share with us your first exposure to military life, such as your time at cadets at school? I think the joining the cadets was optional in those days. And when I got to the big school, as was called then, in 1935, I joined the the cadet outfit at that stage. And I was in it then from 1935 until 1939. I'd previously entered the prep school at at, um, fifth year. So I had two years in the prep school and then moved on to, to the big school. So I was in the cadets for four years that I was in the upper school. And Doug, how would you say that the time in the Knox Cadet Corps helped shape you for your service in military life later? Well, I think it was very important because to start with, we knew when I joined the, joined the Navy eventually, uh, the first thing that you do, of course, is march, march around and do a lot of drill work. And they teach you the fundamentals of what a 303 rifle looks like. And of course, I knew all that because I'd had experience with it. Apart from that, I'd learned to shoot straight 
because we used to go to the range out at uh, Maroubra as a cadet. I knew how to drill and I knew how to march. And that was represented the first year, first weeks of your time in, in whatever service you happened to be in. So it was in, immensely important. It was important later to me, actually, as well, because when I joined the Navy, I got a, as a sailor. We went out to this rifle range again and were tested. And I got cross rifles on on my uniform, which meant that I was a sharpshooter, and that was that was a direct result of being in the navy. And when I eventually joined the ship, that was an influence as well, because I was nominated to be the sharpshooter. That so that if they saw any mines bobbing around, I was supposed to be able to shoot, uh, explode the mine from from the ship knocking off the spikes that stuck out of these big cylindrical mines. Uh, luckily, we didn't find any mines because I'm pretty sure I would have missed. I think in fairness, Doug, and to our listeners, trying to appreciate if you're on a ship and it's going up and down and you're trying to fire with a 303 against a mine which could be you know, hundreds of feet away from your ship and you're trying well, to hit... It would need to be... Uh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. It, it would be... Um, an incredibly difficult shot. But, Doug, what brought you into the Navy? Because most of the Knox boys actually went into the Army. Well, one of my close friends at school was was a guy called Tony Carr, and I'd been sailing with him in his father's yacht. Not very much, but I'd done a few uh, races with him because I was more interested in playing cricket than I was in, in sailing. But Tony became a paymaster at the anti-submarine schools down in Rushcutters Bay. So he suggested uh, that I should first of all go for the anti-submarine branch of the Navy, which I did. And, and <laughs> I was lucky enough that Tony, being the, uh, a paymaster, a petty officer, knew all the tricks that of the examination so I was well primed even if I had cheated yeah. because I was feeling de fairly desperate at that time I'd, I'd first of all tried to join the Air Force but that but that wasn't possible and then I tried to join the Army and they said well we're not recruiting for the the next division to be recruited was is the eighth division and we won't be recruiting for that for another month or two and so i rather fell into the navy by default as it were and anyway i came up for the examination down at rush cutter spay and i was greeted by lieutenant commander quince which i don't oh, know if that yeah. name is anything to you yeah he's a teacher at knox he was the he uh, assistant headmaster at uh, the prep school at Ewan House. And after the usual greetings, he, uh, he then examined, examined me and said, well, that's okay, you'll pass, but you won't be able to uh, come into the Navy until you're 20 because we don't accept, you can't be a, a fully qualified officer, sub-lieutenant, until you're 20. So that that wasn't much use to me anyway, and I still had six months to go, I think, or at least six months before I was 20. So Tony Carr then suggested that I should join the Yachtsman Scheme, which, I, of course, uh, there wasn't anything like... There was just the... Uh, just all you had to do was to have done a little bit of time in a small ship or a small boat. Actually, just before we leave Quince, Doug, I, I've had it said that... Uh, by a number of the other old boys we've interviewed, that uh, Quince was a real inspiration to the boys at school and he'd actually served in Jutland um, and therefore he was quite an authoritative figure um, on the boys at the time and indeed you're not the only boy from school that he met at Rush Cutter. So uh, quite a lovely association. It was a lovely association and the first of quite a few. I had another extraordinary event when eventually I was drafted to a ship. The Yachtsman's theme was that you had to do your preliminary training, which, which was to learn about knots and splices and anchors and ropes and chains. And then you, having done that, that took six weeks. And then having done that, you joined a ship. Well, when I joined a ship, I was the, in Portsmouth in 1941. It was in December and in the Merck, uh, coming down the gangway, carrying a ha his hammock and his kit bag, was a guy that I was at school with in, in Ewan House, John Bottomley. Oh, really? And 
I actually relieved him as the only Australian in the in the destroyer, and that was an extraordinary coincidence. So tell us about your destroyer that you are now boarding in Portsmouth. Well, it was a hunt, uh, hunt class destroyer. It was a member of the first destroyer flotilla based in Portsmouth, and we did convoy duty mainly around the the Channel, as well as that patrols in the English Channel and in the North Sea. And then on one murky day, if you know anything about naval history, two German battle cruisers, the Scharnhorst and Eisenhower, made a dash from Brest because they were being bombed out of their existence there. We we referred to, in the Navy, referred to Brest as DFC Alley because that's where most of the people in the Air Force were collecting their gongs. And uh, anyway, they made a dash up the channel and bearing in mind the channel's uh, only 20, at, the, at its narrowest, is only 20 miles and they kept close to the French coast. Our destroyer flotilla was sent out to intercept them. Goodness knows what we were going to do, I don't know. And uh, when they fired a salvo from their guns, it was like the earth shaking, as it were. But they escaped. In, as well as that, we had numerous patrols where we met U-boats and trawlers and German convoys, usually at night. And uh, there were actions there. And then eventually the ship went off, was uh, part of the destroyer flotilla, which accompanied the Canadian forces, which landed in the combined operation at Dieppe. Before we go to Dieppe, I just want to step back to the Shan Horse and Ganassia operation, because for our listeners, I don't think in fairness, you've really given them an appreciation of how dangerous your position really was. I mean, you're on... Berkeley. It's a hunt class destroyer, as you've said. And for our listeners, a hunt class destroyer has a basic displacement of a bit over a thousand tons. What you've got a 146 crew on board, and you've got these four four inch guns. Now, even though there's a few of these destroyers, you're lined up against the latest German battle cruisers. They are capital ships. Their displacement is over 32,000 tonnes. They've got closer to 1,650 crew. But these guns they have, um, they've got nine of these uh, massive guns. And one broadside from those that actually hits your ship, if it does, sinks a ship. So I think, with respect... We're very lucky to speak to you because if these ships had actually engaged or you'd closed with them, we probably wouldn't be talking with you. I think that's a fair enough summary. Yeah. But bear in mind that they chose their day well. Visibility was very poor. And we never actually caught sight of them. There was no radar. And it was really cha a chance if we suddenly got within range. I never regarded it as being all that hazardous because you couldn't see the enemy. You couldn't see the ship. No doubt, no doubt if they uh, suddenly it loomed in sight, I wouldn't be so been as, as happy about it as, as to in talking about it. But I do recall we were able to see the fleet air arm go over. There was a 21 fleet air arm swordfish, which was an ancient biplane used by the fleet air arm as torpedo carrying planes. And out of the 21, 16 of them were destroyed. Our main function was not necessarily to try and blow the the Scharnhorst and Eisenhower out of the water. Our assumption was that they would have air cover and we were essentially anti-aircraft ships. Uh, um, and the four-inch guns were very effective against, because they had such such a high elevation, they were effective against, against aircraft. But we didn't see any German aircraft at all. So I, I can't build up the, uh, I can't build up too much of a story about about that, except the extraordinary heroism of the people who flew those swordfish. They suffered uh, terrible damage. They actually made one hit, I think, on uh, either one of them. I can't remember which one. And uh, But it didn't impede them. They were proceeding at 30 knots. Our maximum speed was 28. So that gives you a picture of the situation <laughs> as far as we were concerned. And eventually, after three or four hours of 
going flat out trying to keep up with them and get to the point where we could be even effective in a small way, they escaped. It was one of the extraordinary events of the war. Our listeners shouldn't um, forget that the swordfish, of course, were so famous for their action against the Bismarck in crippling her. But, uh, Doug, can um, we now move to the Dieppe operation? And can you tell us the role of the Berkeley in the um, Canadian attack at the French port of Dieppe? The geography of Portsmouth is that the harbour is a fairly secluded harbour and it's an an ideal sort of naval base, as it were. And uh, after you left the harbour, you went out to a place called Spithead, which was in our terms, was out in Sydney terms, was outside the heads. And there in July 1942, after I'd been in the ship by this time by at least seven months or eight months, had risen to the exalted rank of quartermaster. (laughs) And that had no danger attached to it. But we assembled in July, uh, the middle of July, with a whole lot of uh, troop landing ships, a very impressive display out in Spithead, and the rest of the flotilla, there were eight ships in our flotilla. We were there for two or three days, having previously ammunition ship, which meant that we'd taken on a lot more ammunition. So we didn't have an idea, we had no idea where, well, certainly as a sailor, we had no idea what was afoot, but it was obviously something was afoot. And after two or three days, we turned around and went back into harbour and our uh, CO came on the loud hailer and said, well, I can tell you now that we were going to mount a combined operation in Dieppe. Now, that was in July. We then went on a boiler clean for an, each watch, the port watch and the starboard watch, had 10 days leave. And we went on leave, and, and it seemed inconceivable to me, although I didn't go join any pubs and, and blow off about how, uh, how, uh, how we were going to go on this raid to Dieppe, but it's inconceivable to me that out of the nearly 9,000 or 8,000 Canadian troops which were there, plus all the the other uh, eight times 140 of of, uh, 1,000 near enough of sailors, plus a whole lot of landing craft as well, that in the month that took place between that time and the time we actually went, somebody didn't say, well, you know, after a few beers, we uh, we were off to the air to do mount a raid. And then when we went back to the ship, which had broiler cleaned in Cardiff, came round to Portsmouth. Uh, by this time, it was um, early in August. I had my 21st birthday in the ship on August the 3rd, which is another story. And the ammunition ship and went out to the same place and met the same ships that were there previously and started off almost immediately on course for France. And the captain came on the ship and said, well, this time we're really going to Dieppe. And uh, there were were a few ashen faces around the place. And it it was borne out as well, because I'm quite convinced as, as a... As a lowly sailor serving a four-inch gun on one of the destroyers there, that at three or four o'clock in the morning when we got there, it seemed to me that all hell had broken loose and uh, that we were expected and that the Germans were either by chance had reinforced the whole port or had prow warding and had brought people in to uh, defend it. And uh, our role was virtually to, as anti-aircraft, again as anti-aircraft vessels, bombard the shore over the heads of the soldiers that were landing on the beaches in about three different places, but on we were assigned to the main beach. And uh, we then carried out a bombardment. We were bombed about at least half a dozen times by uh, aircraft and uh, it narrowly missed the ship. But as I, I said in one report that I, I'd made, that I, a skipper who would just sort of look up in the sky and see boot, see these bombs falling and then either say hard to port or how to starboard and they would fall harmlessly within 50, 60 yards of the vessel. And uh, he, uh, he was very adept at that, but he wasn't adept enough to miss the final lot, which the ship during the withdrawal 
of the Canadians from the from the shore. The worst thing about it from our, our point of view, from the ship's point of view, that possibly 40 or 50 Canadian, injured Canadian soldiers had been taken aboard and they used the wardroom of the ship as a medical centre uh, because we had a, a standing ship, ship surgeon. And uh, the bomb fell just forward of the wardroom and completely wiped, it, wiped them out. That was one of the sad things. If you visualise a, a soldier going into all hell on that beach, which was like a mini Gallipoli, really, as it's been written up, and uh, then being injured and then coming back and taken to a ship and then not surviving. But our ship was uh, in the... We, we laid smoke screens and bombarded the shore, did anti-aircraft support uh, because it was a, the Royal Air Force was heavily heavily involved there, so we couldn't do too much. Often we would uh, have a target of a German bomber. And uh, during the withdrawal symptoms, which must have been, I suppose, you lose track of time, it must have been after. We got there at about 3 o'clock in the morning and it must have been around about 10 or 11 or early in the afternoon. We were withdrawing and uh, we were bombed by a... uh, Dornier being chased by a Spitfire. And one theory was that it ditched its bombs to to lighten the load so that it might get away from the Spitfire. But I don't know about that. I think it, I think the... Anyway, whatever, whatever happens, the ship, the ship was hit for it. I was on the after guns crew. After a few minutes, the majority of our crew that were amidship when came up from below the stokers and so on and so forth, were taken off in a steam gunboat which came across alongside the vessel. The captain came to the side of the bridge and I looked up and saw him and he just signalled, thumb over, get over the side. So in a slight days, because you don't really know how extensive the damage is, how how much, the, how quickly the ship was going to sink, because when they hit those destroyers, they they're like tin cans, you know, they're very, very thin sheeting uh, the, uh, on the sides. A 303 bullet will go would go through the side of the ship. You don't really know how long it's going to be, and it was listing pretty substantially. So those of us that were down at the after end of the ship went over the side. The first thing I noticed was how extraordinarily warm the water was. It was it was amazing. It was the middle of August, of course, you'd expect it would be, but you uh, after suffering so much coldness in the earlier months of the year of 1942, doing convoy duties and patrols when it was bitterly cold. It was quite a relief to find the water was so so nice and warm. But eventually we were picked up by a landing craft and taken to another destroyer. And this second destroyer was the one that manoeuvred in position. And the Barclay hadn't sunk by this stage. They torpedoed it from oh, close range, 200 yards, something of that effect. And uh, that was the end of it. But that destroyer had suffered quite serious casualties. And they were short of guns crews. There. So they asked me if uh, if I would be willing to act in the same capacity as I had in the Barclay, which was a, a gun loader, to go into the sister ship and take up the same position, which we did. It was an efficient guns crew because we warded off a quite strenuous attack from Fokker Wolf fighters aiming to strafe us. We got back to Portsmouth that night, and uh, that, that was that. I offloaded then. Doug, before we leave... Dieppe. It's a very interesting battle and actually not a lot is known about it. And it's certainly not one of the great battles of World War II that's readily spoken about. And I think it's interesting just to give a little perspective because Churchill had been on for all these commando type raids. He had some success up in Norway. There was pressure from Stalin. You know, the Russians wanted some relief. You know, what were the Allies doing? And there was this big Canadian army in Britain which had to be tested. And to your point previously that in July there was a dummy run and everyone was back at port talking about a possible raid on Dieppe, that the Germans did know it was happening and the Germans were prepared. It was just a, an absolute disaster. I mean, two-thirds of the Canadian attack force are casualties. They're either dead 
wounded or prisoners. The first sea lord, Dudley Pond, who didn't want to risk any of his capital ships, you know, puts the eight destroyers, and it's just incredible coincidence that the one destroyer is yours that's actually sunk. I mean, it's amazing that more weren't sunk. And I think a lot is not given credit to the RAF because the RAF actually, Royal Air Force lost, I believe, over 100 aircraft, you know, far more than yeah, the Germans. No, I uh, think uh, it's the best part of 100, somewhere yeah. like 98 or something. And, and but it, go on. Yeah, and it's a bit like Dunkirk that even though the men on the beaches didn't see the Air Force, the Air Force were doing tremendous work behind the scenes. I mean, at the end of the day, it was that those German bombers that took you out and, and could have done a lot worse if the destroyers and indeed the aircraft hadn't done their job as well as they did. There's no no question about that. The whole of your uh, dissertation is, is totally accurate as far as I remember. I mean, the RAF were heavily involved and they gave whatever protection they could to the uh, troops as they landed. But other aspects of the air to be considered, I've read up a, a bit about it since, not a, not a lot, but there was no doubt that I was fully aware that there was pressure coming from Russia, who was in its own death throes, it has to be thought. They wanted some relief from that. And in fact, I think a couple of German divisions were taken from the Eastern Front and brought to the Western Front, to the Channel, to protect channel ports. So in a, in a sense, it was a success from that point of view. It was about even Stephen as far as the number of aircraft that were shot down. But the most significant thing is the realisation which they didn't have at that time of how difficult it would be to mount a, an assault on a French beach. With the geography of the whole area, it helped them select Normandy, for instance, number one. It then helped them to understand what a major operation it had to be in the sense of the protection for the, for the troops landing after the DF experience where the troops had virtually been sent blindly into a beach. Bear in mind what the beach, the main beach of DF was like. It was a, like a standard beach in Europe. It had pebbles and there's no sand as such as we know it. And then at the town itself was on higher ground behind and there was a wall that had to be encountered. So the success of the army had to be relied heavily on being able to get tanks and armoured vehicles ashore. I don't think they were successful in, in respect of that at all. And it was a very valuable learning experience which the Canadians suffered. As far as the Canadians are concerned, and we were well aware of this when you visited pubs, they had been brought originally in great haste from Canada to back up the English forces against the expected invasion. And the troops had left Dunkirk and left all their equipment behind. When we were given guard duty around uh, HMS Collingwood in Fairham, we had to go guard duty around the uh, the precincts every night. We were handed a bayonet welded to the top of a piece of one-inch gas piping. And that was supposed to be a weapon against invading forces. I mean, that shows you how desperate, really, they were in England in order to try and catch up against an invasion, which was, by the time in 1941, which we were there, in fact, in retrospect, the danger had passed because of the success of the Battle of Britain. Dieppe was not a total failure, but of course it was a, a, a dreadful thing for the Canadians. There's no question about that. But they'd been cutting up rough in the, in the English pubs and in the towns and... <laughs> Uh, pillage and and rape, etc., uh, for over 18 months. They arrived in England in force in 1940, and then they, their first action was in 1942. Doug, I think the story of Dieppe and indeed chasing these German capital ships, it just shows that in a typical war service period, indeed of everyone, that you can have cadet training at school, you can be training on ships or land bases, etc., for years, and there are these days or minutes of incredible 
stress and disaster in your case, where the engagement with the capital ships that didn't happen could have been life-changing for you. And then certainly at Dieppe, to be fighting off these bombers, to be on board when your destroyer is hit, and luckily for you, as you say, being down aft rather than up forward, and just having the presence of mind to be able to escape overboard and and to get away from the ship. You don't know whether the ship is suddenly going to blow up or rapidly sink and suck you down with it. It is an amazing story. And look, the war goes on for you, but certainly they are two high points. And there's a few other things that happen that that are, are interesting, but could you share with us, if we go to the end of the war now, um, with, you know, your flotilla is serving as part of the occupying force, and if you could just share with us your experiences then. Yes, well, the other notable thing that I did uh, during the war was to get married in England in, at the age of 21. Uh, and to, towards the, I, I, I mean, one of the motive forces, obviously, for me to stay in England and serve in the Australian Navy and the Royal Navy was because I had, my wife was there. After I was commissioned, I had a, a period of six months or so in the submarine service, and then I had an, quite a nasty accident to my hand, which put me out of the submarine service. I then went into the, the small ships like the MLs and MTBs and MGBs, and uh, I was given the uh, made commanding officer of a vessel that, of a vessel that was built in. Dar es Salaam in uh, Tanganyika, and we did convoys in the Indian Ocean in this vessel. I then uh, sailed. It was a half a tiller of, of three ships. Uh, we sailed from there to Bombay, which was 3,000 miles in a very small vessel, which, which was quite an experience. From there, the vessels were decommissioned and handed over to the Burmese Navy, and I was sent back to England and arrived back in England and then I appointed as the commanding officer of a ML, a B-class to ML in a flotilla on the East Coast and bearing in mind that it's now March of 45. The war's almost and, over. Uh, yeah. And we did, uh, we did duties off the coast of France to support the troops which were already landed. We didn't see any action as such, uh, but one... My ship was on patrol off the coast of France on May the 8th, 1945, and suddenly we saw the lights going on in the, on the shores of France. Uh, we hadn't seen any lights at all for, the, for over five years or four and a half years. And uh, the lights came on at shore, and of course the, on the radio we heard that the Germans had capitulated. Wonderful news. Uh, so we missed the BE celebrations, which was rather sad. But uh, because they were quite something. And after that, that flotilla of MLs was sent to Cuxhaven in northwestern Germany. Ten days after VE Day, we arrived there. We met. You've obviously got a fair knowledge of the, the events of that war. It was the northwestern sector, which is, which is the British sector. And we weren't allowed to fraternize with any Germans or speak to them at all. But we did mix and have joint uh, discussions with the soldiers. And they had been the soldiers that had relieved Belsen, the concentration camp. And they had movies of their actual entering the camp. And that was one of the horrifying moments of the war for me because we really had no appreciation of what was going on in Germany at that stage, we knew some pretty nasty things were happening, but not to the extent that they really were. Thoughts, it's the thoughts that happen to you in old age of events that took place, you know, 75 or 80 years ago, become muddled. You become more aware of what you were fighting for then than you ever were while you were actually doing the so-called fighting. Yeah, and indeed you're on a ship and you can see the waters in front of you, but you've got no idea of what's happening on the land beyond you. No idea what that. As Churchill would testify, if there was one battle that Britain had to win, it was that battle, the Battle of the Atlantic. So, Doug, it's been an amazing story. It started off on Sydney's North Shore and the Knox Cadet Corps. You're in the water 
off Dieppe with German bombers all around you. You survive this. You represent our nation in arguably one of the greatest cataclysmic events of all time, and you survive. Thank you for sharing your story with us today. Thank you for your service. Thank you very much. I will need a while to recover because these, these things, uh, talking to you, raises memories that, that uh, linger and people that linger. It raised memory, those memories which are all part of life and uh, a bit unfortunate to have lived such a long life and have such memories. That was Angus Horden speaking with Doug Gilling. If you like the episode, please post about it on our social media. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram at Life on the Line Podcast and on Twitter at LOTL Pod. Our website is www.lifeonthelinepodcast.com, which has more information about the team and our World War II documentary miniseries. Life on the Line is brought to you by Thistle Productions. Artwork by Big Cat Design, music by Dan Van Workhoven. Thanks for listening. And lest we forget. <laughs>